Hello, hello, hello. The greatest of beards here to uh, to have a little talk with everyone here. Thanks for everyone tuning in. Uh, we have the first live stream of the channel. I finally have a channel, guys. It's uh, very exciting, and it's uh, it's really cool to have access on on here for this live stream. There has been a lot of stuff going on on this chain in the, in this space. Um, it's a funny thing. I'll talk about it more on the stream, maybe. Um, I ventured I ventured a little bit outside of the of the our chain, our ecosystem, and immediately it hit me how little content there is, or how little people are actually putting themselves out there. Maybe it's because I'm in this YouTube echo chamber. Maybe, but I'm I was really trying to get some information um, from people talking to a camera or having live streams or whatever and there's literally nothing yeah some content where i figured like it felt like i was getting scammed or i didn't want to engage with it any uh, at all um this is, and that just made me appreciate again how good we have it here and it it makes me really want to double down on this ecosystem even further um it's really sp something special that we have here and uh yeah, I'm glad to be part of it. I've been part of it for for a long time, and I see uh, more and more people jumping on. And I see also it's really cool to see more people, different people, um, getting the mic and uh, talking their their things. And the rotation of it is really healthy. It's really cool to see new people um, online, new people explaining stuff. And uh, it's also really cool to see that the people that I was talking to years ago are still here and are um improving just like i am about and learning more and more about this space and it really feels like we are at the edge of uh yeah of what is it the technological uh improvements in the yeah the bleeding edge of this technology so yeah let's have a talk about it and uh, i really want to zoom out a little bit um to talk about the bigger picture as well because we get lost in the meme coins and the shit coins and the in the weeds, let's say. Um, yeah, let's see where this stream gets us. Um, by the way, if anyone in the chat could tell me if my audio is good again, because it was a bit messed up in the last video. So, yeah. Without further ado, access alive. What's up? Hello, man? hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Proof of beards, episode one, first ever live stream. I mean, he chose me. Channel. What are you, what are you thinking about <laughs> pick, doing this with me? I mean, you could have picked Richard Hart, but you picked me. What the heck? <laughs> Richard doesn't respond to my text. Sadly, doesn't look at his emails. Doesn't doesn't even answer the door when you show up and knock on a front door. <laughs> Can't even give him pizza. <laughs> Can of tuna might work. I don't know. He might Maybe if you bring it. some Arby's. <laughs> no, no, no gold gold encrusted caviar or something. <laughs> How's it going, man? You've been uh, going kind of crazy, huh? I speak yeah, to you about like been. every day, but it's interesting to, yeah, just to check in with you. How's yeah, it going? I mean, Mark and I, we have like a pretty, you know, regular, I would say, business relationship and, uh, you know, which has turned into a friendship or I don't know really which came first. It was kind of both, I guess. Um, and uh, one of my biggest supporters uh, is Mark and he uh, he produces the best videos in all of DeFi, so that that's always a plus that you got a friend like that in the space and he continues to bleed his heart and soul into the pixelated world of digital art and uh you know we appreciate him for that and i would recommend you know i'm sure everyone tuning in this morning is probably um afternoon wherever you are is uh familiar with beard by this point but uh if you're watching this on the playback and you've never heard of beard before uh he makes the best videos out there he's an amazing animation graphics artist and uh he's got a good sense for totally different styles so he, his style isn't limited to just one type of design or another um very flexible in that way and always willing to take on a new challenge and then usually in that process we've found that he discovers new ways to um crystallize a new form of art and so that's always been cool to go through that creative process together with you and uh 
you know, if uh, you know, there's been a couple of people I think that's contacted you recently about doing some design work. So I would say, if you guys are listening to this, follow through on it because um, there's a waiting it, list. <laughs> it definitely makes that's good to hear. That definitely makes your content pop a lot more, as you saw from the intros here, um, and uh, adds a level of professional flair to the things that you're working on. So, anyways, uh, just huge congratulations to you for how far you've come in the last 365 Thanks, days. <laughs> And uh, excited to see where we are in the next. Yeah, it's really something. What I noticed in my also profession in the real uh, real world is that once you make a video for someone and so kind of solidify the brand, the person getting the video kind of sees what the brand could be, and then it's like the, that person starts to lean into what the brand could be or the business could be, and in that way, I even think there's more um, value in even that than just you know, what you're showing to the people is is more the the feeling that you get when your brand is uh, presented in a high quality way let's say and it's really cool to see uh, i'm basically shaping brands even though people just ask me for a video <laughs> yeah it's definitely um that's what's so cool about the way that you work is that you're thinking a lot broader about something and how and you're actually are yeah. doing like brand um development instead of just like creating a video for somebody and i think that holistic approach to design is because of your deep connection to nature and your under your deep under philosophical understandings of things in life and your your earnest desire to see those things to see things through positively and 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 um and to make like a, a, just a better um a better world of course but just to make um to, to set the bar so high for yourself but also for yeah the quality of work that you produce you know and, and because i think philosophically when you when you dig deep on something not only does it benefit the person that you're working for but it it amplifies your own ability to do more down the road by a magnitude more and I, this might oh, yeah. all sound like abstract philosophical but no really when you when you pour your your energy into something with full force it comes back tenfold yeah pretty much yeah and it's uh yeah it's really interesting how it is true on every single aspect of life basically and it's also really cool to see this in the markets as well as if you're if you're just there to i don't know only extract basically you're always in that position of oh, i need to get out or i need to <laughs> um basically leverage other people to like get better um on the backs of other people whereas if you're just there and you're trying to improve everything then there's no way you're gonna lose because you're gonna throw yourself in these situations where you're winning so hard just because everyone around you is winning so hard and that's actually why I never really had my own channel. It's because I was I, I was completely fine with it, just being in the background, just making videos for people and helping people around because it doesn't really matter if I get the views or someone else. As long as I'm connected with the people that are successful, then who cares, right? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. And, um, you know, you've experienced this, experienced this now. You know, you've been in Hex community for four plus years now right and, and yeah you know it's over time the people come and they go and you if you're <laughs> on the right path you you just keep elevating to a new level and then the people around you changes it's like a, a more metamorphosis that occurs where like the outside world reflects back to you the quality of character you are and uh you get surrounded with that success success breeds success and it's so true you know I, i'm i'm discovering this on my own too you know we both are and that that uh that you know what you never thought was possible is definitely possible we're, we're living proof of it you know that uh if you stick to your guns and you have a vision and you uh and you have principles that you stand by you're willing to stand up for um you know, and you stick with it and be consistent, it, it will produce uh, results beyond what you could have ever thought was possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy how that works. Huh? 
No matter what it is, you can just do it. <laughs> I've also noticed this new phenomenon. This will be a sticky subject for people. And maybe you yeah. have some insight onto this too, which is the higher up you go on, on the ladder and the more success you have, the world tends to throw at you the, op the opposite too. So like the better you are in the world trying to make the world a better place and, and just trying to improve your own situation for you, yourself, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your business partners, the more the outside world reflects back to you the, op the equal and opposite negative reaction. Or if you're, I'm sure the same is true as well as if, which no, I wouldn't know for sure. But like, if you're, if you're, you're walking down the self-centered path or negative path, you keep going further and further down that path. Eventually the world will try to rebalance and send at you positive energy. So it's like, it's almost like a, um, a reinforcement mechanism. So it's like, if you're walking down the positive path and you're getting elevated to a new state of being, and you're surrounding mm -hmm. yourself with more and more high level people that are successful, the world will start throwing more and more attacks at you or, or threats or harsh statements or, you know, and it's kind of like a, a check to see, are you really on this path for the right reasons? Or are you going to fall back into the weeds and into the negativity and the, and, uh, and so I think nature naturally tries to rebalance all the time. Um, you know, you've never seen that phenomenon about like, like the 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 best people die young or or suddenly you that phenomenon where like if somebody was just a gem in the world and uh for some reason like their life gets taken too soon it's just this phenomenon where if you're if really? you push too thing? well i've seen it in my own life where some of the and i mean of course this is all subjective but where people where people yeah, are sure. like the just selfless giving people they, sometimes they just they 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 go too soon, um, and I, th I just think it's an interesting thing. It's like as you're on the path, it it as you are more and more successful, it doesn't get any easier. It'll it'll get it'll. I mean, it can be you can get better at managing the stress and challenges of it, but it doesn't get easier. But nature yeah. definitely is always trying to rebalance in the same way that there's light and dark. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder about that, man. Like, it, it makes sense, but like, I don't know. The mo I, not yet. I don't really live that yet. Maybe I'm not good enough yet, Axis. <laughs> but like, I don't really. Too busy um, morphing pixels, so maybe that you just haven't gotten. Could be. You know, you're too focused on the work, maybe. I could, I could expect it once I get like the. People know I want to have my own food forest. Well, we can we can look uh, outside and see that it happened to someone like Richard Hart, who was yeah, trying okay, to do true, the right but, thing. And, yeah, but I also think that's a lot has to do with the way he is doing it. Mm -hmm. Like it could be more subtle. Like it could be with uh, with less. Um, I think it could be with less resistance, man. Oh, for but, like, sure. That's dude. that's I just so the way too. he chose it. Like, but it's also fine, complicated but... when you're that powerful. Um, yeah, exactly. Like I can't even imagine. So like when you when you, like like f look at anybody that's powerful. There's a group of people that hates him and a group of people that loves him. Elon Musk. Some people hate Elon Musk. Some people think he's like a savior. You know. Yeah. For different reasons, or like Bill Gates, or like Steve Jobs. Some people said he was like a nasty person to work with, but yeah, he also changed the world and the trajectory of Earth forever with his with his visionary mind. Um, and so I think the farther you walk down that path, the only one who's going to be able to ultimately say whether or not you did the right thing when you were alive was you, between you and God, you know, or whatever you want to call your God or whatever, you know, whatever you want to call goodwill in the world, because it can be, everyone has a different relationship with spirit, but, sure. um, you know, ultimately like, you know, if things will look a certain way, so like, I'm saying this now today because I'm experiencing this lately where people are taking information that I'm saying publicly and they're twisting it in their own way because it's what they want to see. So everyone's yeah, viewing true. the world through their own window or their own lens. And instead of actually listening to the words that's coming out of people's mouths, they're hearing the things that they want to hear in the context they want to hear them and they're unwilling to be open 
and, yeah, and neutral true. to absorb the information as it's meant to be heard, which puts a lot of extra um, pressure on the deliver on the delivery from the person broadcasting the message because then now we have to be extra careful about what we say and how we say it. And this is something Richard calls the risk diode. It's like it's better yeah. off. It's a lot of oftentimes you must you're better off saying nothing than it, than something. Yeah, pretty much. That makes me think about like I think two years ago or something when I was streaming a bit more. At some point, someone made a video like exposing hex or exposing whatever. And I got quoted in that video and I was like, that's not at all what I said. <laughs> and that kind of hurt me. Like I, I was watching it. I was like, how is this, how is this a thing? But I can see like uh, as if enough people watch you and enough people have an opinion, like that shit is just going to be constant. And so yeah, you, you either just say nothing anymore or you, you, you kind of become, yeah, you don't really care anymore, I think. And then you just, because I think you need to stay strong and just say whatever needs to be said anyways, because mm -hmm. the people are going to cry about it anyway. So, yeah. It's, uh, uh, definitely it's a challenge because you want to, you know, as somebody who broadcasts messages regularly, yeah. it's you, you want to say things that you think are going on, but, and you can even say, say I'm not 100% sure about this thing, but it looks like this is happening. And... You can make all the disclaimers you want, but somebody's going to receive it the wrong way, or somebody's going to make an assumption <laughs> here or there, or have expectations here or there. And uh, because like in, in the internet age and in the information age, people only get snippets often; they don't listen to the whole stream. Yeah, or, true. Or, you know, it's a it's a deep. It's there's a lot going on out there, guys. But we're it's a good time to be alive. We're in the right place, and uh, I'm excited to you know dig into some uh, interesting. You know, maybe some discussion on m the markets a little bit here this morning. That'd be cool. Yeah, um, I have an interesting question in the in the chat from uh, Timothy. I would like to know more in depth of how your research is conducted. This is a great question because, <clears throat> so you know, crypto is the way crypto markets move. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, something can launch and it can and and if you don't listen if you don't hear about it right there at the moment that it launches you could miss out on amazing returns so the way I've handled this in the past was um, and I'll get back to the research part of this question in a second is if you don't act on it when it when you first get the information you could miss out majorly so the way I acted in the past was I would just ignore I would just evade and ignore all of the incoming signal in terms of like um, a newly launched project or whatever. And I basically only stuck to blue chip cryptos um, mm -hmm. because it was just, the, it was the safe route, the conservative route. And I'm naturally conservative. So when it comes to doing research in general in crypto, especially, I mean, you're taking in information from all kinds of sources across the web. You can use platforms like YouTube and X, and telegram and um and then as you build out your real world networks you actually get really strong connections with people of status or that have information like the real information um so you can get it from people um, that you trust of course curating that down and, and distilling that down into something that's got a good success rate is what is like the million dollar question or the million dollar uh, ability to do that and so, so when when you're absorbing new information, of course, you can imagine that you're not always going to get a hundred percent hit rate. Like nothing is a hundred percent. And so it's it's important that to to, to disclaim that you know I don't say a fraction of what the things I hear or like learn about at this point because there's just no way for me to go out and verify every single thing at the blockchain level. So, but. When I'm doing research, I am literally, especially in my early years, I was literally going through YouTube videos, like picking out people that I found high value. And one that will come to mind right now that has always been a very, very good resource in the, in the, in the crypto market, specifically Bitcoin, was Steve Courtney from Crypto Curry University. That dude has nailed so many big long-term swing trade calls on, on Bitcoin. Like if you just track his analysis, 
you will have a really good idea of what's going on with the Bitcoin market. Like he's amazing. Um, he's unbiased and he uses the same charts for years and years across time. And, uh, so I think that I think doing, and when it comes to doing crypto research and market research, you want to find people that have a high hit rate that you can come back to and see consistency out of them and follow them as, and put the, and, and, and index them into your, into your, notepad like that's the guy that's one of my guys and i'm going to come back and see what he's saying on a regular basis um and then you know there's like the lower level signal which is pretty noisy which is like on x where you can get all kinds of opinions and flavors <laughs> of characters and content and like 90 percent of that stuff you could just brush off um and and just be okay with the fact that you're not going to hit every single you know possible investment strategy trade or idea um, and just ch and cherry pick out the ones that you feel are good or that you see confluence between data. So if, if Steve says something and crypto sniper says something and, uh, somebody else says something that I trust and I'm starting to see, uh, an alignment in what they're saying, then I think it's got a higher probability of it being a good hit rate at that point. Cause I'm three or four of my good sources are starting to say the same thing. You know, at the, especially at a reversal point in the market, it's going to start to inform like, OK, maybe there's something here where there's this confluence of ideas and data. There might this actually really might be a, a market cycle low, for example. Um, and then as you start to index these things in your mind, you'll know who was early and who was mid, who was there a little bit late and then who was there later. And then you can file that in there, too, of like how quick are they at seeing the truth? And you basically create this portfolio of people that are just nailing the truth and they're nailing it in a, in a certain sequence of like, okay, this guy's always first, this guy's second, this guy's third. Yeah. And then over time, of course, that evolves too. I could think of another one that comes to mind where a guy that I thought was really, really good early on in uh, the, the last bull market in 2020 and 2021 at calling Bitcoin. And he was a really good technical analyst like he knew how to teach support and resistance lines and market movement and momentum and stuff, but he was just really bad at making calls. And so, but that's not something like you find out until later on is like, are they, are they, are they good at technical analysis with probabilities, but they're bad at making calls and stuff like that. And you'll be able to distill that down. So it also takes time, like a long time of, yeah, of involvement. Sure. Yeah, a lot of the um, what I noticed is in the yeah how how do you do research? I think for every person it's different, um, but also in in general it's it's more about who you know instead of what you know, and that that is true in um, in actually getting the the proper information. As in, if you know people that are very good at this, if you know them personally, you're gonna get better info than if you just uh, watch some uh, tweets that they make. Um, but also, yeah, if you know people on, on YouTube that actually know what they're talking about instead of just um, have a YouTube channel, basically, that makes a big difference. And I think I try to get people into, uh, into crypto or to educate them on crypto, um, mostly because there's just almost no way you're going to do it on your own in the beginning because you're going to get you're going to lose so much money in the beginning because you're going to do you're going to listen to so many um uh, crypto influencers that are just there to to take your money basically and there's a complete difference between the way we talk and the way like mainstream most crypto influencers talk uh, that get paid to talk about stuff it's crazy the the insane difference between most people in our community and then whatever's out there um, that people normally see on their on their screen. Mm -hmm. um, and I was always at the beginning I was very bad at doing my own research because I would just that's the whole thing. That's what Richard also said. Like you can do your own research, but if you don't know anything, then you're just gonna accept anything that people are gonna tell you or that's gonna be written on the website. And so it's the most um, knowledge and the most um, value I got 
was from having discussions with people that I know are smart and I know that have been here for a long time because that's the only way you're going to see if something is bullshit or not, basically. So then people... this was... Right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go on. I was just going to say, so like Tim, um, Tim Harris said that uh, the in-depth detailed info seems more difficult. Thanks for joining Don. And I, so I think it's important to make the distinction between research of research and actually educating on education on the tools. So like when it comes to like, you know, actually being educated on how to use liquidity pools, what front ends to use, where, what is safe and what is not safe, what is best practices in security. That stuff is like, undeniable like you have you need to know that that stuff is you need to find an educator that you can you know hang your hat on that's gonna teach you the stuff and not you know drag you along and they that you can ask them a question up front and you'll get the answer right away stuff like that where like how to how to do ta that might be a little bit of a tougher question to handle because there's so many elements to each asset performs differently. And so there's different things to look for. And so that's like a skill that you build up over, you know, five or 10 years. Whereas like, you know, analyzing a liquidity pool or, or, a, or an LP histogram or doing chain analysis, that's like, that's like science. That's, that's there. It's in front of you. If you know how to do it, like a process for it, you can repeat it over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, so that's basically, yeah, those, those things you can just learn and just ask. I would say just talk to a lot of people, just ask questions, keep on keep on being here, basically. And that's the cool thing is um, day by day, I sometimes just get a random epiphany, like, oh, I learned this in the bear market just because I stayed around, just because I was here and just watching. Even though it hurts, I mean, I was to hear watching things and I know the feelings throughout the whole um, cycle. And that that is more valuable than I initially would expect. Like you would think if you just leave for the painful period, then when the winning period is there, um, it's all good. But actually, I think the painful period is the, the period where you learn the most and you you understand the plays that you can make in the easy period, let's say. Yep. If you leave, you know, and don't come back for two years, you're going to be behind the curve. It does take a honest effort to be here and doing the work every day. Otherwise, you're going to miss stuff. Dude, just, just look at how much has happened in the bear market. Like if you just would have left for two years, yeah, you how much you, you wouldn't have a clue <laughs> because the meta game is always changing with crypto. Yeah, um, that's something that you can't. It, it's. I guess. I guess if you have years of experience, it's coming back would be a little bit easier. But sure, like memes, like meme coins, like Dogecoin. Like yeah, there was one meme coin that was called Dogecoin, and then and then Elon got involved and it pumped like crazy, and then that changed crypto forever. Because before that, it was all about sound money, you know, VTC maximalism, you know, and uh, but once that happened, it it changed the metagame a lot and now yeah. there's like thousands of chains well hundreds of decent chains that you know you got different metagames being played on every every chain and i think the what i can say all that is like screw all that <laughs> honestly like you don't need to be in any of that like just find one ecosystem that you like a community that you like and drill down on that one and that's kind of like while we're here on pulse chain is we think that this is the winning chain yeah, and why do we think so? Like, <laughs> um, I think I'll because, let you start. Like, why do you think Pulse Chain is going to be the winning one? Well, I think it's going to be one of the winners. I think we're headed yeah, toward sure. a multi-chain world, but uh, I'd rather be on the team with a billionaire or a group of billionaires that, than I would on some chain where it's... And by the way, these billionaires tend to, you know, help their assets perform that helps their users, you know, historically. And so... <clears throat> And you have verifiable proof that those billionaires are using funds to prop up the chain from time to time and give and pump uh, economic energy back into it, which is nice to know that you can validate those things. Um, and yeah, we may not have all the answers, but you can see some proof of that. And uh, I mean, Hex was the first attempt to reboot the Bitcoin, reboot Bitcoin, like with a different, different name, but the same principles of sound money and uh, 
you know, with better functionality, faster block times, um, produce trustless yield, all this stuff we've been hearing for five years practically at this point. And uh, so I, why wouldn't the forked Ethereum copy that the whole thing was, you know, started on would not have like some sort of a path forward? Um, I think it's pretty ignorant. And now it seems to be that there's a lot of um, things lining up for Pulse Chain that's unique to Pulse Chain. Um, besides, you know, just making it affordable, where like you're educating a whole new class of blockchain users, which is pretty powerful because the these things live or die on the community that's behind them. And I think this community is stronger than ever because you have these sub communities that are forming and they're all competing with different ideas of how to grow their own little ecosystems and and it's it's that and you know so then you pick up new people into each little sub ecosystem and so then richard always said uh would you rather have a smaller piece of a of a bigger pie or a bigger piece of a smaller pie and i think that you want to have a a just absolutely enormous global bank in DeFi, a massive pie and you just have a smaller piece but proportionally it's going to be way bigger than the original pie ever was yeah yeah, that's for sure. And um, what I what I see now is what I saw back then. Like the reason why I got into into Hex was literally the the community. That was really interesting. I first joined the community, and then I learned why the community was there, just because of the the asset uh, beneath it. Um, and I just saw a lot of energy. There's a lot of energy going around and it's, it's starting to move faster and faster. And the, the, the same thing was with Hex. That was my um, investment thesis back then. It was, it was like the, the energy that I'm seeing here is accelerating. It's not slowing down. And that's what I'm seeing right now in Pulse Chain as well. Sure, we had our hiccups and the price went down, but I saw energy moving forward and getting quicker and quicker, faster and faster. Um, and it was just, wait, my dog. I got you. <laughs> Do you hear? Yeah, I got yeah, distracted. So the the um, the energy just go, gets faster and faster, and it, that's what I'm seeing in the statistics now as well. Is that we get more people, not less, and we get more projects, not less. We get more communities, not less. And so every day that something is improving in this chain, I want to be there more and I want to um, contribute more. And I know the the way in nature, it, like nature works in abundance. And as, the more you give, the more it comes out. That's the whole thesis of a food forest as well. You put more into the system to get more food out. And that's the way agriculture should be, uh, should have been, but now, Normally, the society is built on you put as much in and you get less and less out, basically. That's what's normally happening in this society. But what we are seeing now and what I'm in implementing in my entire life is that the more I put in, the more it comes out. And if that is true in a system like this, then I want to be there and I want to be there more. And so far, my thesis is right, at least for me, is more, the more I put in, the more it comes out constantly. Mm. And yeah, I just see more and more energy. So it's, it's really good to see. That's why I think uh, we're going to win in the long term. Yeah, there's just so many people building so many amazing things on Pulse Chain. And, uh, you know, everyone's got opinion about what should be built. But the point is that people are here in their building and there's real value here. Um, I think we could look to Hex as an example of something that's, you know, beat down like, but the reason why it's beat down in price is because that is the economic resource, which would allow, allowed all this to occur. Yeah. You know, and, uh, it, so, I mean, it's, it'll, it'll have its time you know, I think people are kind of wondering, you know, when is Hex going to do something? But, uh, <laughs> it was like the reason why you have pulse chain and why you have why all these guys have done so well or not done well <laughs> is because it, it was that was the uh the scapegoat that was the thing that all of value was derived from and so but once the uh once the, the everything is rebalanced i don't think you guys understand how the hex price is going to change um you know, I've been, I just made a tweet yesterday, like, hey, pay attention to, 
it's like time to start focusing on hex again because it's yeah. been range bound now for, and I'm talking in pulse terms, not dollar. I'm not really looking at the dollar chart so much, guys. But uh, over the past 30 days, there's been 35 million dollars of volume, and the price is flat at 100 pulse per hex, and I think that's going to be a significant level forever. And uh, it looks ripe for a breakout in my mind, and it's it's when nobody's talking about it that these things occur. So I hope you've been Always. paying attention. Um, you know, we saw this with ink too, where ink was the shit coin and nobody cared about it and it was a dump forever coin. And then, um, we're all guilty of this, by the way, I'm not immune to, you know, dunking on a coin that's not performing. I've, I've done this before with, no, I can remember you dunking on it yet. <laughs> yeah. Because it was like, this thing is a leaky hole. Sense. This was my thought was like, this is a leaky hole in the whole ecosystem. If someone doesn't patch this hole, it's going to be a problem forever for balls chain. Yeah. And uh, somebody patched the hole and bought all the supply up, which is what needed to be done. And then it then went and did a 22x. And so it's like, you know, there's 1.5 billion hex for sale right now in the pools. And if somebody came in and pushed the price to 10 cents, you know, almost 700 million of those are going to be taken off the market. Like just and, like that. And it's exactly the same what's going to happen. Everyone's like, oh. Oh, it can do something. And then all of a sudden the energy is back. And I've been making videos on this channel. Uh, I think at least half of the videos I've covered it is that the amount of current holders of X is just constantly going up. Even EHEX now, like it had a dip. It's not at all time high like PHEX, but it is constantly going up now. And we get less and less stakers. So people have less, um, yeah, conviction to actually stake. Oh. Um, I think people are scared, um, but they are willing to take the bet. And that's interesting because, and it makes complete complete sense, right? Like you said, this entire this entire um, chain has been built on top of Hex, basically. Hex is, has been used as a uh, catalyst to, to build this. And so it makes sense, like hindsight, um, that Hex would be suppressed so much, but it doesn't make sense to treat it as as if it's uh it's time has passed because it's time is just beginning it just got a better platform it just had to make a little sacrifice to to actually build that platform but if you think about how impressive is it that this all came out of hex investors basically like how is that it's insanely valuable man and that it gets treated as if it's uh, trash it's 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 just beyond me man even the statistics show you that that is it's doing great basically so i'm with you on all that i think uh you know it's all going to take a little more time but we're we're getting close and then yeah. uh cabana's talking about btc sub 60k and that it was above 60k for 5 seconds <laughs> and uh it's interesting that uh i of course i watch bitcoin um what a boring asset. But no, hey, I'd like to see I'd like to see Bitcoin retrace here. I think it would be super cool to see just a few months of sideways and slight down. Like maybe go test as far down as forty six K, uh forty four, forty six K that region. Um, just like a mid cycle lull would be perfect. It'd be so poetic to get to shake out people and to create sideways and downwards price action and then we ramp up like really toward August, September time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then that begins the parabolic bull market that goes into 25 and then potentially even longer into 2026. I've been saying that now for a while and I hope I'm right about it. Um, that next year will be the, pro will hopefully be the best year. You know, if this was the triple top, mm, I don't think that it goes as low as the lows down there, at like 20K. I think we could see like... Uh, We'll just run in the. Let me just run a fractal on it quick to say just to see. Yeah, sure. I mean, because BTC does inform a lot of what could happen. So yeah, I mean, if this happens the same way as 2019, uh, we break 60k next year in April, and then the bull market resumes. You know, imagine that where we get a next year of year. sideways, a year of sideways between wow. 45k and 70k. And this just becomes a new range. And then you really actually start ramping up next, you know, next Q1, Q2 for Bitcoin. That would be pretty crazy. Now, is that most likely? 
Maybe not. I don't know. People we'll would see. get really bored and altcoins would bump like crazy. I think, I think so. I think so. <laughs> uh, they got the ETH ETF uh, listed in Hong Kong now. So I think that's a bullish event, right? And so, you know, maybe we don't get so much downside. Um, but ETH did ETH Bitcoin ratio did break the uh, the Giga pennant, so like support that was support oh, going all the way back to uh, January of 2016. Yeah, it's uh, it's now trading below those levels. So, yeah, it's uh, it's anyone's guess now what happens next. You know, in terms of timing, uh, of course, I I'm bullish on ETH, but uh, yeah, it did break that level. Yeah, I think it all. That's in. I'm not necessarily the the most adept in the the charts, but I am like I know energy basically, and that's what I'm I'm seeing is that energy is building, and that's enough for me, man. Like I'm I'm here. Let let's because uh, it can go all the all the ways, right? And, uh, yeah, there's definitely no set path. Like we can guess and we can see how things are going. But what we can definitely do is uh, see the energy and see where things are trending. And that's kind of obvious for stock me. Stock market, like here's something else that's going on right now in the U.S. stock market is it's just you're getting hard rejected off of these levels. It's down 5% in uh, a month so far, 14 days, I guess. It's been down 5%. That's a lot for stocks. Yeah. Um, and so maybe that this is just that, you know, sell in May and walk away thing that happens every year around tax season. Um, let's see what happened last May. Last May, we actually pumped. This May, we're dumping. What did happen in the previous May? Oh, we were in the middle of a huge correction and we dumped hard. So that what I'd like to see is that stocks comes down another 2 to 3% and then goes sideways and then bounces out that level. I think any kind of capitulation here is a dip to buy. I, I think, you know, inflation's here to stay and we just saw new highs on gold and it's, it's certainly trading at 2387 currently. Dollar is going up and gold is going up at the same time. There's just so much interesting stuff going on that shouldn't be, which is these like legacy assets are going all up together and th that's not typically how it happens. So they're actually seeing the stock yeah. market kind of croak right now is actually kind of a good thing because that, that, that's what should happen if dollar goes up rapidly like you should see risk assets go a little bit off so that's good and bitcoin is respecting that too because Bit bitcoin is both trying to be a, a safe haven and also a risk on asset at the same time and that's conflicting yeah so it's interesting to me that it, it, right now it's acting more like stocks where it's kind of going down a little bit but we could see that reverse quickly too because the, the world is kind of divided on what bitcoin really is yeah, you see it. Sometimes there's this flock to safety, which then they see Bitcoin as safe. And then all of a sudden people act like it's uh, a risk on asset again. <laughs> and they get out again. It's really uh, interesting how that uh, paints the chart. So um, recently you said, I think it was on the, the uh, Fed's channel a few days ago, you were talking about the U.S. Treasury notes. Um, and I'm sort of well versed in that as in when I'm listening, but I can't really talk about it yet. I'm not um, too well known on the American system, basically. Um, could you talk about like, could you explain a little bit what you said there? You said something about the, um, the U.S. Treasury notes that it that there was a very big amount of n notes and basically bypassing federal reserve am i saying it right or yeah so um you can pull up my screen and, and i'll kind of try to explain this to the best of my ability this is something yep. we talked about on the in our private session on monday at accessalive.com um ah, it was a private session ah, okay <laughs> we uh so i want to start with um i'm not an expert in this stuff this is just hearsay um this is just for educational purposes only this is for fun most of all yeah and um so i could be completely off the mark on this but this is what i'm gathering from i'm just my trying very, to learn man. from yeah. my very light level of research that's been done on this topic and it's all hearsay okay so now that we got that out of the way 
Um, this pr- page is called usdebtclock.org, and it kind of tries to show you what the economy looks like. It's a pretty cool site. I'll post it. You know, most of us have heard of this, but if you haven't, here's the site. It's interesting um, what's going on here. So if you go down here to the money creation tab, there's there's three different categories. There's on the right here, there's currency and credit derivatives. And it's saying that there, so this is all of the, um, the a derivative. So I'll kind of read the, uh, the caption here. It says a derivative or credit default swap is a credit der- der- derivative contract between two parties. The buyer receives a payoff in an underlying financial instrument if an underlying instrument defaults. So there's like currently 623 quadrillion, I believe, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions. Okay, 623 trillion dollars of cur- of credit and debt. Der- these derivatives, right? So this like this is fugazi. This isn't like real money, M1 money. Whereas like this this middle tab is the U.S. M2 money supply, which is uh, M2 consists of the M1 money plus savings deposits, small denomination time deposits. Individual retirement accounts, IRAs, which we know that you know some of us use those, um, and balances at depository institutions, balances in retail money market mutual funds. So it's a combination of, you know, what you call real money or closer to real money, not not just you know derivatives. But then on the far left, you have this thing called USA Treasury dollars, which is representing this other kind of money that is not Federal Reserve notes. So this is, and this happened twice in history that it has here. And for example, um, it's, uh, it happened in 1862 with Kennedy, uh, with uh, Lincoln, and then again in 63 with uh, Kennedy. And so what these USA Treasury dollars are is it's their wealth based. So like based on the wealth of the country and they're debt free. So there's no money, there's no repayment mechanism for the creation of these monies. And it's non-interest bearing, so there's no interest piling up. And this money is issued by the U.S. Treasury. So this is different from a Federal Reserve note. So the Federal Reserve note, the money that you, you know, you, it's the green note that you get when and you're using to transact here in the States. Um, it's a Federal Reserve note. It's not, it's not a U.S. government note. Um, and that's important to understand what a Federal Reserve note is and how it comes into existence. So... In order for the Fed to create a dollar, the U.S. Treasury has to send over a certificate, basically, that represents the creation of that dollar. And then the Fed sends back the equal amount of dollars back to them with the condition that the U.S. Treasury then pays the Federal Reserve the original money that they minted plus interest. So it's a Ponzi scheme because you can never get out of this loop of always having to pay back more Federal Reserve notes than you minted. And when I say you, I mean the U.S. government minted. So there's an exchange that occurs between the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve where U.S. Treasury says, I want to create more Federal Reserve notes. They send over their stuff. Federal Reserve prints the dollar, you know, digitally prints it now, sends it to U.S. Treasury account with with the with the condition that they have to pay back the original notes plus interest, which you can't create the interest on the U.S. Treasury side or you can't create new notes on the U.S. Treasury side. So you always have to, it forces, it pins the U.S. government in a position where they always have to borrow more from the Federal Reserve to pay back the interest that was owed. And so it's like a, it's a Ponzi scheme is what it is. You can't, there's no way to ever pay back yeah. the notes because you'd have to mint more to pay, to pay back the interest that's owed. So what these USA Treasury dollars are is they're, Wealth-based, debt-free, non-interest-bearing money issued directly from the U.S. Treasury bypassing the Federal Reserve. And so in 1862, President Lincoln issued $450 million directly from the U.S. Treasury. And these were debt-free and interest-free, and they were called greenbacks. And I'm sure we've all heard of the greenback before. And so this was just money created on the good faith and credit of the United States. Like, we have a GDP, and we can say we can afford, like, the Treasury could say, like, we have a certain number of GDP, I think it'd be safe to print 5% of that GDP in notes to help stimulate the economy. No, There's no payback. This will just go into the economy um, and hopefully for, for the better. And then again, in like in 1963, um, President Kennedy signed Executive Order 11110 and issued $4.3 billion directly from the U.S. Treasury bypassing the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, 
these debt-free, interest-free notes were known as silver certificates. So it is possible for the treasury to print its own money. And this actually goes back to the very beginning of the country when the United States was founded. They actually created a currency called Colonial Scrip that bypassed the British money system because we they can't, you know, there was, Britain was like on, on control of the money system at that point overseas. And uh, they came here and they said, we're going to do our own thing. We're going to make our own money. We're going to make our own government. We're going to do our own thing on the, in the States. And, but because of things like wars and debt, um, it was, didn't take very many years. It only took like less than 10 years before colonial script was written off. And then we were, the United, the original United States was kind of pinned in a position where they act, had to actually borrow money from overseas. And that started the cycle of what ended up in three, um, defaults, uh, by the U S to pay back these loans. And it, it's a deep thing. You, if you want to know more about that, you got to go listen to some people. That's a lot smarter than I am on this topic, but it's, it's a very interesting convoluted history of money creation and, uh, a, to change of hands that's occurred. Cause remember the federal reserve was created in 1913. Um, so this actually, so the, the whole president Lincoln thing that was predating even the creation of the fed, but the United States has always been at a financial warfare with the world because of its it's trying to be its own free sovereign nation and being trying to be able to do its own thing on its own. But then constantly the world comes back and tries to dig its claws into the United States because it is a free and fair country constitutionally. And they, they always find a way to manipulate the system for their own benefit. And uh, this is called usury. And this is why crypto exists is to try to solve this problem of usury and um debt debt enslavement in the in the uh in the economy globally um but so back to the u.s treasury dollars you can see that since uh in the last few years there's been a, a new there's new usa treasury dollars being created so there's now 1.5 trillion and more every minute every second um usa treasury dollars being created so somebody is working on creating a sovereign money right now and it's not very much not very well known or talked about but somebody is working on this actively and we're we're producing now usa treasury dollars and you can see the m2 money supply is declining so we're getting rid of the pyramid scheme money and we're creating our own sovereign united states money and this is why i think and this is speculation of course that the other countries in the world, like the BRICS nations and other nations, are trying to get off the Federal Reserve money standard because they see the writing on the wall that this is going to be the death of the old Federal Reserve dollar. And there's going to be a new dollar that stands in its place. Whether it's a CBDC or not, it's going to be called, the, it's going to be these USA Treasury dollars that's going to be backing the full faith and credit of the United States based on its GDP. And, um, and one of the things I heard, and don't quote me on this because it could also be wrong, is that these new USA Treasury dollars are going to be issued at a rate of 1,000 to 1 or something like that. But let's just look at how many exist. So if there's 1.5 trillion, um, this basically, it would be like a factor of, just based on the supply dynamic, it would be a factor of like, 50, I think, 15 to 1. 15. Oh, my math is terrible. 1.5 times 15. So it's like 14 times. There's 14 times as much Federal Reserve M2 money than there is USA Treasury dollars. But so one of the things I heard was that there, you're going to see this thing where everything's going to be repriced because there's going to be a lot less USA Treasury dollars and you're going to have to convert yeah. the Fed dollars into USA Treasury dollars. And so that it'll reprice everything in the, in the globe and it'll bring down the dollar price because it's going to be based off the new dollar, not the old dollar. And I would, I would think that if, um, if you're going to change, um, the, the way you're going to value things most of the time, if you're in the, if you're, let's say you're the person that only holds fiat dollars right now, you're going to get screwed in some way. Right? Like I would imagine there's a, an insane amounts of risk holding that asset in the transition to the other one. It's kind of like. If you're in crypto and you're hol you're holding a coin that is going to a V2 and you have to basically uh, convert your your V1 into a V2, there is risk in there. Like 
it's a uh, you're gonna get maybe a bad rate or you're gonna yeah you can lose a lot of money in that way and i would think in in, in such a um yeah high change environment in in this world it makes a lot of sense to be in in assets that are valued in other assets as in that are separate from this system like crypto that's what i tell people a lot as well as if if you're valuing everything in dollars and then the world is gonna value everything in uh in jelly beans let's say then if you're holding crypto that's no problem because you'll just convert whatever rate is there and then you get jelly beans instead of dollars basically but if you're holding dollars then all of a sudden it's not worth anything you the only thing you can do is listen to the rate that's been given to you basically yeah, you're basically kind of pinned. I mean, this is why diversification is kind of a good thing. You want to have different kinds of wealth. You, maybe you own a home, maybe you own a business, maybe you own precious metals, and and maybe you own cryptocurrency, so that you're at least, you know, diversified. So that if one of them fails, you have you know value. You have you know value somewhere else. Um, it's pretty sounds pretty simple on the surface, I guess. But none of us are really doing that. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm all in on crypto, but that's because I think it's the future, and I'm and I'm taking a huge risk. But I'm also young enough that well, you know, yeah. If things fall, if things fall through, that you know, I'll be able be able to recover. It's not getting. My idea is like, look, if if I'm wrong and crypto doesn't work out the way I think it's going to work out, and I have to go back to to this to the slave job system again, anyways. Well, that would that's fine. I'll just go back to doing that or whatever. I'm young enough that I can do that now. Not everyone can have that luxury, and so maybe sure. it makes sense for you know, p- you know, people that have large families and and they have to protect you know their their kin. Like you, you're going to want to be a somewhat diversified into multiple assets. Yeah, but often they are already because they've been around longer and already had something set up before crypto even was a thing, right? often like not, oh, yeah of course I not always so. the case but you know the whales i talk to they they're not just in crypto yeah they they have real estate they have that metals makes sense. they have you know so they're you know and they're a lot of those guys they're just actively bringing more capital into crypto they're not going the other way obviously we're going into a bull like we're, we're, we're our year into a bull for bitcoin so um yeah i mean every day on this planet we get more into digital worlds right we get more into the blockchain and we get more into pulse chain basically because it just gets better and better this is the uh, precious metals market mm-hmm. everyone production has went up a lot for all these countries but it looks like let's see i'm just seeing this for the first time i mean everybody is accumulating gold and it's it's obvious because when you look at the the price it's it's like during unstable times people always go back to yeah look at that what's (laughs) worth it's like Like bitcoin right this is gold so here's something interesting so here was going gold got an etf and then after that happened you know gold shot up 424 percent over i think it was like an eight-year time frame 2,892 days and then uh, then it topped in 2011 double top retraced and then it bottomed out in 2015 when Tr- President Trump was elected and then ever since then it's been on a rise so it's kind of, isn't, that, isn't that kind of like a cup and handle thing oh for or sure should the, or should the handle be lower then no this is a hundred well I mean it, it can, so as long as the handle doesn't meet go down past the 50% mark technically oh, okay. it's a valid cup and handle technically um but yeah you can see the cup the handle and then it it, it actually uh broke out retested the top of the resistance and then busted off that level so that, that's like a textbook yeah, nice. breakout retest and resumption um yeah beautiful and then if you measure the how high it can go it's actually uh to around three thousand dollars an ounce you go from the bottom of the cup to where the breakout level was and then you just take that from the bottom of the handle and then that's got you at 2800 an ounce and we're almost there and i was calling for this with with the contrarian in our private group we called this bottom literally last uh it was three months before i opened accessalive.com i did a 
a private session for the Discord members with Silver the Antidotes um, Discord server. And this was the triple bottom on gold. So we actually, <laughs> it's so crazy. Now, if the contrarian would actually just stick into his trade, he and it went long, he could <laughs> he'd have been making bank that way. But of course, these gains are tiny compared to crypto gains, but there's also shitloads of liquidity over here too. So but yeah, this is like that perfect, look at how perfect that was, how that was respected on the candle close. You see that? One, Even two, the body said three, one, four, five, arm. six weeks <laughs> of candle body closes perfectly at 1640. And then you had the three wick lows. That was a tr like a clean, like this was That's the crazy. most obvious. And this is because, you know, central banks were like, all right, give me all your gold. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, or governments at least. Or Costco. Uh, Costco shop. Costco, yeah. They actually ran out of gold. <laughs> So you heard that right on the private? Yeah, oh, they, they don't have they they sold out they sold out of their entire stack of gold immediately. I was I was saying to that dude. Ugh. Yeah, it shows you the, how uncertain people are on the dollar right now. Everyone wants gold. And no everyone's getting smarter market. about this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the whole thing because of the internet, right? Even people that are just on their own, they get the information that institutions can get, basically, if you if you're looking at them in the right places. So you get more and more people that get smarter and smarter. Um, I notice it in my in myself. I make completely different decisions than other people that are just um, playing video games and stuff. Hey, I gotta like, say, I, sorry, I'm fucking. My mind is in two places, but yeah, Zen, go on. you have to you have to have Zenith on your channel because he's yeah, you guys would have really good chemistry. He says collective learning curve is crazy to see in real time. It's so true. Like the the, the collective learning oh, yeah. curve of, of of everybody, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's a good comment. Yeah, if you want to join the channel, definitely reach out to me. If you on Twitter on, on or on Telegram or yeah, it would be cool to have some more in depth conversations here. Because, well, one reason why I started this channel again is like often I don't really. Like I, I'm okay with talking and I'm, um, often have thoughtful, um, conversations with people, but, um, something in me just sometimes tells me just don't tell people, just don't talk to people because I don't know. One part tells me everyone knows it already. So who cares? And then the other part tells me, yeah, what, yeah, why? Like, I don't. I have my own thoughts. It's fine. But I've seen over the past two years so much trash online, man. Like so much, so much thoughts that just aren't um, the full picture, basically, and just simple s screenshots, basically, of people's thoughts. And they're not at all um, tied to the context of, of life and, and of the actual markets. So that's why I really... I just needed to start, I guess. And that's why we're here to have conversations like these because they're very important. Mm -hmm. And people are like diving into this space for the first time every day. And so you, know, you and I might be up here talking about stuff we've been talking about going back to the whales only streams, years, you know, three yeah. years ago. <laughs> and, but it, but, but it, you're always going to reach someone new. So it's, it's good to revisit these things and, and talk about the things that are hard to talk about that do take a lot of research with it with the disclaimer that you know we're not the experts on this stuff but that this is the way we're seeing the world and if that's valuable for you then take that and go take it a step further for yourself i think is the key it's uh it's been very valuable to be here for years now and to also know you for years um i really i i'm starting to really notice it now in my decision making to just like i've had conversations with people like you that would blow a lot of people's minds in the real world. And I can't even, there's this thing that I can't even have proper conversations about certain topics with people just because they haven't watched the streams that I have basically, or they haven't seen the data that I've seen. And that's the whole reason why in 2020, I guess, I was telling people like, okay, yeah, you can enjoy um, what you have now, but you're going to have giant inflation and, and all these things and everyone's going to have to work harder and uh, it's going to be a shit show basically. And then no one really understands why. Whereas everyone that I was talking 
uh, about it here just knew exactly what we were onto and we've been calling things two years in advance constantly like it's it's been so interesting to to just watch that and we're, we keep on doing it like in two years i already know that we will have called a lot of things that will happen in the next two years and just keeps on happening it's just very valuable and that's also maybe i haven't been on streams a lot so some people thought i was gone but i've been in the backgrounds working for people just making videos and just talking to people and that's been so valuable like one of the most valuable things you can do is to engage in this community and bring your qualities bring your um your assets and bring your um your skills because everyone needs it and you will um benefit tremendously from that just because you'll get to know the right people uh so you had a list of questions uh that you wanted to cover maybe we can wrap up with these um yeah sure let's start with hex it says why hex might be the biggest opportunity at the moment well um i'll start with the usd chart so you can see how on the this is phex by the way guys um look how well that level was respected i just drew a, a horizontal line between the first wick low here on the december 6th and the second wick low here on april 12th and so of course the price can in dollar terms can come down if pulse is going to remain weak this can float down to here and go flat but it looks like that there's some effort by whales to protect that level and then if we if we look in and that by the way the price on that is six tenths of a cent and then if we look at the uh pls price you get a whole different picture of what's going on so there's this massive falling wedge that's occurring these are bullish reversal patterns typically like you'll get like a three wave sequence out of here something like this it's just going to be like a huge explosive move um and when it when it occurs i'm not this is not obviously exact I've, i you don't it's know it's gonna happen how, now guys right but it is getting awfully close to where we rode down so you can see how we had like support 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 and then this was support here recently and it was support here on this wick so that's a significant level but then you can really see that the midline here this has been respected all the way down and as soon as it tried to break here it popped back up above and ever since then price has been ranging in here around 100 to 1 pls per hex and now you're getting to the edge of the falling wedge this seems to me to be a pivotal turning point now it doesn't have to go vertical it could just curve its way out like this slowly and then it'll get a pop maybe later or it could you know the longer it stays in here the more of this supply is going to get absorbed um right, let me pull up crispy man's uh liquidity pool data so we can get an idea of you know what's actually going on here in terms of like coins that are available on the market and maybe it'll give us some insight into what yeah. i'm seeing for hex when in doubt check hexfire.io so if you want access to the best data for hex you have to sign up for hexfire.io uh, he's got this this closed off section exclusive member data and uh, inside of here we'll, we'll be able to pull up the LP set up, set up. So let's do it. So you got three things here. You got, well, you got four things. You got the liquidity of hex in the pools. You got the liquidity of pulse in the pools. And then you got the e hex liquidity in the pools. And then you got the sum total dollar value of all of these three coins. Now, I will say that this number, some of these numbers are getting updated. So we're actually going to pull in more data from more sources to show the true number here of e hex liquidity. Because there's really actually not not 19 million, but actually 1.2 some billion ehex on the pools, but 700 million is on nine millimeter. Um, so I actually wanted to drill this down a step further and show you what I'm what I mean and why this kind of is irrelevant right now, but it will be relevant later if I can find if this the website loads. Um, hex on Ethereum. 1.1 million dollars of liquidity on here so if i click on okay so yeah this was the uh bank x wall 
So you can see on here the bank X wall. There's 700 million EHEX for sale between, I forget the price. I think it was like between 007 and 1.3 cents or something like that. Yeah, 1.39 cents. 007 to 1.39 cents. Yeah, okay. So a lot of it's sitting in here, but you know the price is way down here. So is it really relevant right now? The price is like somewhere down in here. Is is this stuff relevant at the moment? No, but it is fair that we get that stuff put in and show it that it's actually available on the market. So this is going to get updated. But um, the number I'm looking at here is this 1.5 billion hex for sale. 1,550 millions mm -hmm. is 1.5 billion. Um, if the price of P hex moved to 10 cents, like the snap of a finger, 600, about se almost 700 million of these would be off the market. So about, it's not quite half. It's like 600 and some odd million, 675 maybe was immediately going to get sniped up, assuming no one bought or sold. Right. So of course you'll have fluctuations because of the buys and sells that comes in on the way to 10 cents. But I think the thing is like as a market maker and a, a believer in hex, if you're a whale, you could snipe up so much supply down here off the market like immediately by just pushing the price up and absorbing all this stuff. But what they're doing right now is they're just accumulating it in this range. And you know, the longer, the lower for longer, the better. Like if this just stayed in here and they, they absorbed like two, three billion pulse or I'm sorry, hex, that's just going to give it way more upside, which is why I believe that this is inevit inevitably going to lead to a massive breakout that goes crazy against Pulse. And there's actually evidence of this in ETH versus Bitcoin. So if we could say Pulse is like ETH and HEX is like Bitcoin, HEX is trying to store value through the T-share and ETH is the gas token and Pulse is the gas token. They're kind of somewhat synonymous in their functionality. Um, we could go back and look at the ETH Bitcoin ratio from the past and kind of say, hey, is there a sim is there similarities or things that could be that could play out similarly? And what you do is you'd go back to the beginning of the ETH Bitcoin ratio, and this is on a weekly, and 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 notice the relationship where ETH crashes against Bitcoin and then ETH rises against Bitcoin, then ETH crashes against Bitcoin, and then ETH rises against Bitcoin, and then ETH crashes against Bitcoin. And this was like the major first major bear market for ETH. So, but if if this same kind of setup is going to happen for the relationship between Pulse and Hex, then right now, this is what's happening on that P Hex chart. Is we're in this period where Pulse runs up hard against P Hex, and what we're looking for is the turning point where P Hex is going to take a, a turn at dominating the market. And taking market share away from from pulse mm -hmm. so so this is where so this little area right here is what i'm trying to explain so if i take this p hex chart and i flip it upside down now you see what i'm seeing in this p hex to pulse ratio or pulse to p hex ratio is we're in this first period here where Pulse is dominating, and we're looking for that that inflection point where Hex takes its turn. And this is a rough draw, but I mean, look at if if we're even somewhere in here, you know, maybe this is the level to look for. Maybe there is one more spike down, or maybe this is the level where it reverses. You know, I'm still trying yeah, to figure we, this stuff we, out too. We don't know. Yeah, but, we don't uh, have any reference, right? We can just because it's still such a new asset, basically. Because right. it's been only a year, we haven't had one single cycle. So, you know, and if if half, if hex waits, you know, later to pump harder, then that's okay too, because um, it still gets a free ride with pulse, anyways, in terms of value that it accrues against the dollar. Um, but yeah, so like again, this period is what I expect for the similarity to how to ETH and Bitcoin played out in the beginning. So how would you think, um, because I've been mostly checking the, the current holders amount, as the price is going down, we have more and more holders. What would you think, what does that do to a price chart if there's more current holders while price is just being obliterated, basically? 
does it have any it, impact it, it, on how ours is going to go up you think yes because there's more adoption of people yes it means that people are even though we don't know who the wallet is but so what you get out of this is this is my thoughts on it um is that you get more and more people holding it no one's going to stake it quite yet because the yield isn't juicy enough and yeah you know if if uh let's see let me pull back the dollar chart here for a second where's 10 cents on this chart Right there. Doesn't seem that far away. <laughs> 10 cents is just not that far away. Of course, it, in percent terms, it's a 12.8x. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it. if more people are adopting it, buying it, storing it away, that first, you know, let's say it goes sideways here, and then we get the first move back up to, like, 3 cents, there's going to be a wave of sellers that's going to get out. Yeah. And then there's going to be another wave. And then there's going to be another wave of sellers that's going to get out. And this could be like a way bigger correction that back down to like five cents. You know, this could this could really this could be the period where you really emulate that move after Godwill pumped EHEX back in the day. Something to like. Um, let me uh, find the chart here. Yeah, so this is what I'm kind of seeing is Oh no. That does it not work that way. Too bad. I think it does. I don't know why it didn't control C. Boom. Wow. Yeah, something like this where, yeah, it sucks. It's long and painful, and maybe it's shorter or longer, but something like this where we we can't, it, where 10 cents becomes a problem. Um, but that's where you get rid of all the guys that's accumulating the lows or when they're shifting their capital back into like Inc. or Pulse or Pulse X. But I think what ultimately what this leads to is like they're all just going to like start steamrolling into each other, and it's all going to be like pumping like crazy in this mad euphoria. Um. But yeah, I think like, you know, your guys that are just accumulating these levels, they're not staking because they know that they'll be able to sell a 3X or a 5X or a 10X. Yeah, that's true. Um, and then that's what will create this like longer term sideways period that'll lead into like, the, this is a dollar up here, by the way. <laughs> this, is, this is rough, but this is, you know what I'm saying is sure. like, this is what it could take. Or like, you know, we go from four, five cents to 25 cents to six cents to 30 cents, 14 37 well, 23 a dollar it fits my the narrative that i've had for the past two years i think where i haven't really talked to about it but i've been watching my thesis basically is where you get this natural um pattern of staking where every that was the the best thing to do back when hex uh, started everyone was taking and every every metric of the system went up and now it gets into this natural correction of people now all of a sudden saying it's the worst thing you, you could do and no one is doing it. And that amplifies the, the people that have been doing it, but you don't see it immediately. And so the short-term people laugh at the long-term people because they're saying, look at how many gains I get, look at this, look at that. And uh, staking is for, for suckers because you can get so much more yield doing this or that in the short term. But then as this is happening, as we have this correction of people not staking anymore, the yield that you get per T-share goes up uh, significantly just because there's more and more people getting out and not coming back into the staking pool. And the longer they do that, the higher the T-share the rate goes, and so the harder it gets for them to get back. And that's so fascinating to me because we have all the time in the world. We have 15 years uh, 
T-share stakes. And everyone is making fun of the, the strategy of having 15 years of T-shares. But just wait for 15 years before you're going to laugh like, because it doesn't make any sense to laugh after five years because we have two more times this entire cycle. You really think that after 10 years, when the X T-share uh, payout is already seven plus every single day now, and that's an exponential increase because more and more people will leave the system and less and less T-shares will be in the system because it goes up um, exponentially, basically. The payout is going to be so huge that, and literally only the people that believed will be left because everyone is leaving now because they think it's dead. And it's such an interesting, there's so much depth in, in that system that I'm, I'm still baffled by how how insanely in tune it is with how uh, human psychology works. It's, it's just fascinating. We're here because we believe in what the, what the code does and it's unchangeable. And uh, I've been looking at these comparisons between what it takes to stake hex for a year or what 10, like what the ink farm can pay me for a year, because I believe that mm -hmm. Pulse is the center of a of a of a seesaw, and then you have ink and you have hex as counterbalances or counterweights, and the scales of justice, so to speak. Um, in terms of the the gold holy grail of yield on pulse chain is one of three things: it's either you're validating nodes with pulse, you're staking hex, or you're farming ink. Um, and so I I've been looking at you know we know that pulse validators earn a consistent like nine to twelve percent, and Hex stakers and long-term hex stakers make more than that, and uh, ink farmers are making a lot more than that currently. And so there's, a, I think there's an imbalance in where the market's valuing yield in its short term, um, mm -hmm. because that's the same thing that's happening. That's a fiat mindset. That's like the same thing that's happening with um, the U U.S. Treasury yields, where shorter-term bonds are paying higher yield than longer term bonds are paying which doesn't make sense because the longer you commit to something you should get paid more for that commitment yeah. in my opinion which is what hex does and it's hard coded that way whereas like the u.s treasury yield curve is not hard coded that way they have to manipulate things to make that a reality um but so anyways back to this point um i do think that ink is still tremendously valuable long term um especially for the bull market where we're in now but so let's just look at like what they're paying out and kind of explain why I think hex can go to 10 cents easily is because if I put $10,000 in the ink farm, it's going to make me $6,000 at current prices. If I put $10,000 of P hex in the, in the, um, in a, in a one year stake, how much is that going to pay me? Um, what is $10,000 of P hex currently? A lot. Let's see. 10,000. 1.3 roughly million and then if i stake it for one year the payout is a thousand dollars so it's so the one year of ink yields pays six times the amount of one year hex stake so there's it's starting to come back into balance because this was actually a wider gap when i was in vegas last month this was like 10 to 1 right now it's six to one remember yeah, this, this ink is, price went down this, a bit Right. So I think that's uh, that's rebalancing where the system as a whole is rebalancing where, you know, it's trying to find equilibrium somewhere where it makes sense what the ink farms are paying out and it makes sense what hex stakes are paying out. So, OK, again, I'll just recap six thousand dollars yield on a one year farm with ten thousand bucks if all things stayed the same. One year hex stake with the same amount of money pays nine hundred twenty two dollars, which is about the ratio is about six to one in the terms of the yield off the two me mechanics. Now, if I go out longer, I'll go max length. This number will change and it's $45,000 is what a max length stake will pay out at current prices. All things stay the same. So I think the truth yeah, is Yeah, but it's over 15 years. So you have to get it down. Like you, you have, have to, to divide it by 15 then. Yep. So then that brings you down to forty-five thousand nine forty-six divided by fifteen. It's about three thousand three thousand dollars a year. So it's still not quite there in terms of a map, but you are giving up that opportunity cost. Of, yeah, because you didn't do anything with it. Because you're locked out of your money and you can't make plays with it. So 
I think this is undervalued tremendously. And so like just watch this change as I switch this to 10 cents. Um, now all of a sudden it's like $574,000. Put it in by, one year. Divided by 15. I will. I'm working my way backwards. That's $38,000 a year. Um, yeah. Versus 6,000. And then let's go to a year. Oh, I broke it. Too Stupid many games. Scout. This website always does this. Why did it have to break when we were live? <laughs> Literally, this site always breaks. Where else can? What is another calculator I can use? Yeah, it's like one, like it's one third of that, because you get three times more, uh, more t-shirts. Um, basically. I think Crispy has this one on here. Let's see. Yeah, it'll be one third of that. So what was the number? I forget now. Five hundred and it was thirty-eight thousand divided by divided by three. So it's like twelve. So it's two x. So at ten cents, you're making two x the yield as you are in the ink farms currently. So I think this is all. This is just all self. It's rebalancing. I think is what the between the three major pillars of yield on Pulse Chain. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's cool to watch. It's cool to, I, obviously I have, I have, and I'm in all the pools. I, I want to, I don't validate, but I think, I think I'm okay with the risk of the other two. I like the yield over there, but, um, but yeah, if you have billions and billions of pulse and you're not actively using it for other things, like that's one of the best places you can go for solid yield. Um. This is one of my favorite tools that Crispy made. So, three hundred three hundred sixty-five days. How much was it? Twelve something. I forgot, man. <laughs> Come on, Mark. The, the numbers are too small, man. I can't read them. <laughs> well, I can basically... One, two, one, two, eight, seven, five hundred. One, two, eight, seven, five hundred. Okay. All right. So... On Pulse, you're making 1.4 million hex. And then at 10 cents, that's around 14 grand, right? Yes. Yeah. No, something's wrong because that's 140 grand. Uh, oh, that's because. Oh no, no, it's because nice. of the. Re, it's because of the. Uh, no, it's not. It, I, I'm oh, sorry. It's with I, the principal. I, I did the total, ah, okay. not the reward. Yeah. So gotcha. the reward would be about eleven thousand four hundred. So now you kind of get a, a feel for. You know how these yeah, systems I think it are makes all sense. balancing. Yeah, it's eleven thousand four hundred bucks. So it'd be almost a two x if we get hex to ten cents. A one year stake should pay almost two x more than one year in the ink farms, which I think is, I think maybe they should be at parity. I think in a perfect world, one year hex stake and one year in the farm should pay about the same thing. So maybe five cents is where support is on on P hex after uh, taking into account all these different yield mechanisms. And if we go They're back. Yeah, this is my this is your five cent level right here where this is gonna come back into test in here. So the math all kind of works out. Plus the liquidity is way lower than ink, right? So it's it's way easier to pump, I would say. So at least last time I watched. Yeah, there's there's only twelve million dollars a hex. Like how crazy is that, man? On this pool anyway. Yeah, but like there's not it's against pulse, yeah. Yeah, yeah Bill's the biggest one. The rest, that's what I remember at least, is that the rest is only like a few hundred K. So the, most of it is locked in there. Yep. We can actually take that a step further and look and see for sure how much is available inside of both V1 and V2. Most of it's in V1, obviously, because you're getting paid to provide that against, you know, hex pulses. 
one of the main pairs. Yeah, we got 24 million in liquidity and then the rest is only like 200K and 40K and basically nothing. It's not loading. <laughs> Everything's broken, man. So yeah, in V one, obviously they're it's mostly all in that one pool. But I think that I think we get the idea of how quickly that hex supply can get sniped up once things get moving. Um, what? So then the other question you had was. Um, yeah, let's pull it up. Which one do you want to cover? <laughs> um, there's just so they're so deep. Um, we should. Yeah, have I got, think we, we should, should have, have these earlier. Yeah, maybe yeah. we should do this again because these we, three really good questions here. We should definitely do this again. Um, but the uh, yeah, most of it you also covered in other streams. I think yeah. we can we can do that another time and see how deep we. We can go into that later. Um, one thing that I, I want to cover still is the, um, the last point, the importance of an educated community. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to say something about that because what I've seen in the, in the last months is you educating a lot of people um, on how to properly do things in the market. And I, for one, have learned a lot um, and it's funny because when you first said something about the, the access token and and wanting it to be an um, educational tool, that's such an easy thing to say. Um, like, oh, yeah, we're doing this for educational purposes. And then you're just pumping your own coin or it's like it, it goes to shit and no one really learns anything. It's just a narrative. And then I, I just started looking at the chart and it was, uh, I remember uh, messaging you like the the engagement in that chart was so clear and clean that even someone like me, like I, I understand things, but I'm pretty new to like analyzing the, the statistics of a chart. And it was so clear to me how it worked and, and, the, and the mechanics behind it and the, the holders, the amount of holders, what the price could be doing, like the, uh, technical analysis, even though it, it can be easily skewed by, by some people because it was small. It was just very cool to see up close how how a chart works. It was kind of like a, if I put a chart under a microscope and see how the thing actually ticks. And that's where I actually got convinced, like, huh, this is actually an educational tool. And it was really cool to really be able to talk about it and, and how it works, not necessarily talk about um where price is gonna go because price is gonna do whatever it's gonna do but more the reasons behind what it is and why it's there and i found that fascinating um, and what i've also seen is that a lot of people have learned a lot from that chart and now also with the solid index so many people are are watching it now and, and a lot of people are learning from that as well as how liquidity works and how to use like they're kind of getting forced to use v3 to um uh, to take profits or to uh, to buy in or to to make fees and i just see a lot of people doing that for the first time and when i look around compared to a few months ago i see a lot of people that have gotten a lot more proficient and at um creating markets or or being in markets and doing that or being in there in a safe way and in a responsible way. And it becomes less and less of this predatory environment where everyone is just trying to be there to get as much money extracted and more and more just a place where people want to put their value and also yeah, just want to use it to learn more and to get more wealthy with everyone together. And it's just, it's been fascinating to see how an educated community can just make itself thrive without hurting the other ones, basically. That's, that's what I, I just wanted to put it out. More people should be educated the way um, 
the people in the access group, for example, are educated. Should be should be more. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. It's um, building your own to building your own coin and setting it up. And what you know, if you set it up in the way that we did it, um, you can track every single person that ever interacts with the contract. And so it makes it easier to say, why did that green candle print or why did that red candle print? And it yeah. gives it, it shows you the behavior that leads to certain outcomes. And if you can really see it, like if you can see somebody make a play and then he's prints, but you saw it first and then it printed, it's like, well, that's interesting. Or like if, if you just wake up one day and price is way down and you go look and filter out that guy's address that just nuked the price, you can see in his, into his wallet and say like, oh, dude, that guy just got out rid of all of his last of his coins. There's no connected wallets. Like, you, this guy's out of power in the system now. So, what should happen next is if nobody else steps in to sell behind him, this should start to go up. Stuff like that, you can actually see because you have a general idea with the, with the scarce supply of that one. You know, if if, if yeah. X, then Y, then Z. Like, it, one thing leads into the. It's so easy with that pure chart to be able to see everything from the TA, which. TA is probably the least important thing on some of these DeFi assets because it just a whale could wake up one day with a hair in his ass and change the direction of the chart. That's how <laughs> risky crypto is. And we've seen it in Axis three times where we tanked 80 plus percent three times. We've also went up 10x in a day multiple times. Yeah. Which is pretty which is a one of my most proudest things. And and so it's like you can look into those guys and see, well, the dude that just pumped it 10x in a day, like, well, what's he got for ammunition? And you could see, like, holy crap, this guy's got, you know, double digit millions of dollars of capital in the system, you know, and he's never sold. Like, what's the implications of that? And so it's just being able to break down the chain analysis, the TA, the liquidity pools, um, and then see actual literal market cycles inside of there that are happening on like a two or three month time frame. Mm -hmm. it, it's like its own little test gra testing grounds to s so you can actually live and experience so much data and information condensed down into like a workable format so that you can yeah. actually walk out of that with real new knowledge. What I recently started to think about more and I still have to get myself around it before I can actually dial that down into a comprehensive video because that's the way I kind of solidify uh, solidify what i what i think i know is that once you so let's say you're in access and then uh, you have the coin and it goes up great you have more value in dollars let's say or in pulse if you sell you're just out and if you know that there's energy increasing in the in the system or in the community let's say you don't necessarily want to get out but maybe you want to take some profit and what I've been thinking more and more is that, like, yeah, you can get really hurt if you do that and then it goes up more. But maybe there's a different way of liquidity providing. And I'm starting to get to understand more and more why big players are providing liquidity. Because I never really understood why. Because I thought always, yeah, but why you can also just sell it, right? Um, but there's so much more value in liquidity providing in the right way in the right moment and yeah it's a really deep topic that seems kind of at first it seems kind of simple but now i'm really starting to think huh there's like there's so much more to that mindset or to that frame of thinking that yeah i don't have a definitive um thought on that but i just wanted to point it out like how interesting it is if you start to dive deep into why basically well we appreciate you know you your endorsement of the process and it, and it legitimizing it as an educational tool and not just like a way to make mad gains um that that's awesome and you know we're gonna see this thing through and there's no telling yeah, how far it can go and and what it all means but uh if you look into the blockchain on on the solid index, I mean, there's some pretty diamond-handed holders in there. So, as long as uh, as long as things you know stay equal, we should be seeing even more amazing things out of this stuff. So, appreciate cool, it. man. Let's um, let's wrap it up.
I would say. I think we've been going for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I would be uh, honored to welcome you back at some point to, get, to cover the other topics. Uh, but thanks for being here, man. Do you have anything else to say? You want to put something out? Appreciate all you guys for showing up for, for Beard for his first stream. Um, I think I have a stream coming up. I got more streams coming. I know I do. They're next week, I think. So, um, But, hey, if you're a part of the membership um, group, we got our AMA tomorrow night. Uh, probably spending a couple hours answering questions and digging into the digging into the meat and bones of uh, the markets. Looking forward to that. Um, thanks for all the support the last couple of weeks. It's been a crazy and awesome time. And uh, if you want to know more about me, just go check out Twitter, x.com slash access alive or youtube.com slash access alive. And uh, keep an eye on the socials. That's where I'll post most of my information and go check out accessalot.com. We are closed, by the way, on memberships. We're packed. We uh, Too many people. We closed out on elite members and pro members. So that was uh-huh. an achievement. Congrats, man. Thanks. Sounds good. All right. All right. Um, if anyone uh, wants to have more comments, uh, drop them in the, in the comments or uh, on, the, on the Twitters. Proof of Beard on Twitter, and uh, you're already here on the YouTube channel. I'll see you guys later. Thanks, Axis. See you guys.